quick here. What does this do? Okay, I'll try it out. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Joel and I'm a level designer at uh, uh, Us Two Games and we've just released uh, Monument Valley 2. Um, this, these are the kind of things I've been working on before I came to Us Two Games. I only came to Us Two Games about a year ago. So, oh, oh sorry. Oh, spoilers. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been working at Us Two Games for about a year, uh, almost a full year when we released Monument Valley 2. Um, up, uh, before that point, I was working up in Birmingham. But uh, I'm here to talk about Monument Valley 2. So Monument Valley 2 is a game about a mother and child. It's a follow-up to the first Monument Valley. Um, uh, who in the room has played Monument Valley or Monument Valley 2? Cool. Okay, so most people know the basics of it. Uh, Monument Valley 2 is a bit different in that we focused on a uh, more substantial story or a more focused story about a mother and a child going on a journey through the, um, through the environment. But the fundamentals remain the same. The idea of moving through this impossible environment where you're making connections uh, in order to move from one side of the area to another. You're looking at geometry and you're moving architecture as your fundamentals. Um, the game when it came out, the people who made the first one were really surprised at the breadth of people who played it and enjoyed it and the fact that there were lots of young kids and people who don't normally play games who played it and this was a surprise, a really nice surprise for the people who made it and it was something we really wanted to double down with, double down on when we made Monument Valley 2, especially with the focus on the story being about a mother and a child, a story that doesn't normally get told in video games. We wanted that to be for everyone who wanted to experience it. Um, so I'm going to try and talk a bit in here about how you make engaging puzzles for people of all abilities, people who are new to games and also people who are uh, still entertained when they've played lots of games. Um, and I'm going to do that through the medium of this particular level, which is called the Sunken City in the final game, but it's originally called Magnets, and that's how we all call it. So I'll keep saying Magnets, and now you have a context for what it is. Um, so this, uh, so I'm going to kind of use this as an example to talk about how we go about that process of making sure that low skilled players can still enjoy the game. Uh, the level in particular was uh, inspired by these pieces of art that were put up uh, on, the, uh, on the wall by David, who's our lead artist. Um, and it, it turned out very different from this, but this was the starting point, the kind of weird shapes in the kind of geometric blocks. Uh, he's an Italian sculptor, you can, oh no, a Spanish sculptor, I think. You can go look him up. Um, but this is the puzzle that came out of it. This was the white box version that got made in around September, and it's probably one of the first, one of the oldest puzzles in the game. It was one of the puzzles that got made earliest, that made it all the way to the end of the game intact. And this is it transforming into the lovely version that is in the actual game. And the layout may look like it's changed, but the puzzle is completely the same in the, in the middle of it. It's the same puzzle that is there. Uh, it's just the kind of in surrounding environment gives it more context. And how did, why did this puzzle survive nine months? Like, how do we know nine months ago that this was a level that we wanted to play with and make a full level out of? So this was the fundamental idea, which was this reconfiguring that with these three rotators, you could pass this block back and forth and make it into uh, all different angles and shapes. And you, using the same static shape, you could make bridges to different places. And this was the exciting thing. And how to make a puzzle out of it was the question. In Monument Valley, like this is one of the very first levels in Monument Valley 2, and it's a tutorial level. It's teaching you about the basic mechanics of the game, but it also allows you to just follow your nose. You look for a gap, you move a piece of architecture, and then you make the connection and walk across. Like you, uh, in the kind of moodier parts of the game, or the parts where we want to tutorialize you, that's great. But for a puzzle that's really engaging, that doesn't require you to think at all. You're just kind of moving things around and waiting for the puzzle to solve itself. So. We need kind of surprise in there, like just kind of moving that object around back and forth is going to make you, like you're just going to get on that object and move it to the end and then step off. So we've got this kind of little mechanic that we use elsewhere in the game where the, the handles retract when you walk onto a rotator. And that kind of adds this problem of like, oh, I can't get across this in the way that I automatically assumed I would be able to. So it kind of adds that extra element, which is intentionality. The player has to stand at one side of the puzzle, look to the other side, and, and try and work out what they want to do. They're not just making the connections as they come across them and, and uh, following the prompts. They're actually thinking about, how do I get from here to there? 
And the fact that you can't walk on it for this particular part of the puzzle with the re retracting handles means that you have to stop, think, move the thing, and then make a move that has intentionality to it. So those are the kind of three things that may just go, oh, this puzzle, this puzzle needs to be in the game. This puzzle deserves to be there. Um, this reconfiguring, the intentionality, and then the surprise, all those three elements added together. So how do we make a level out of this puzzle? How do you expand it out? Well, I don't think you do expand it out. I think you break it down. You look at how you make a, easy, like a lower skill player get to that point and be able to feel empowered in order to solve that puzzle on their own merits rather than, uh, rather than just be overfaced by it or that being the starting puzzle. So what are the fundamentals of this particular puzzle? It has a lot. It has a block that can be passed between movers. It, you can use that block as a bridge. You can ride on that block. Getting on and off the block is needed to progress. You pass the blocks, change its orientation, and handles retract to walk on the block. That's a lot of things that you have to know before you get to this point. And for a person who maybe isn't too familiar with games, that's, that's too much to be faced with at the beginning. I think back to this, uh, this uh, video on YouTube quite a lot, which is by Mark Brown on Game Maker's Toolkit. And I really love the way that he talks about the lead designer for the more modern Mario games and how he breaks down puzzle development, starting with you're introducing a mechanic at the beginning level, you're then developing it, twisting it, and then giving the player a full-on test at the very end, uh, and then you're done with that mechanic. Cool, you've, you've explored it, and you know that players have got the tutorial because they've played through the level itself is its own tutorial. So working out what the, like, the beginning bits are, we should try and tackle those basic elements, like what are, like how do we teach the player that they can move this block around between multiple movers? Uh, another game that someone else said was shite was um, like, uh, it was a game I really liked, but each their own. Uh, I really liked the way that it made you think about how difficulty works in a, in a puzzle game. You, in, in The Witness, you, uh, you often complete a puzzle, and then you go on to the next one, then you go on to the next one. You think you've got it, and then you get to this stumbling block, and you have to think back. You have to look back and work out what exactly you did that made those solutions correct, but your current solution not correct. And I think it's a really good way of, basically, he makes it impossible for you to not complete that first puzzle. And then he's slowly adding in complication over time. So the very first element is to make sure there are no wrong op options. So the first time the player comes across this mechanic in this level, You've just got two movers, and you might not even know what's going on. You're just moving these movers, and you realize you can get from one side to the other. So then we need to make sure you understand what you did. So you put in this kind of, did you understand, a small test for the player to make sure they comprehend what happened. So you get across these two areas at the bottom, you get to this door, then you come out of the top, and now you're, you're there with this gap that seems suspiciously the same size as that block you just moved around. So you have to think about the fact, oh, how do I get this block up here? It was connected to those things at the bottom. Oh, maybe it's passing. Maybe these two rotators are disconnected from this block. And it's a test to make sure that to leave this level, you need to have understood what's going on. No. No. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so yes, that's the simplest version. The simplest version is using the base mechanic in a very simple way that you can't get anything wrong and then making sure players understand what happened in order to progress. You have to act with intentionality. Let's see if this works. Ah, it does. Okay, so yes, we've checked off those first few things, but now we've got more. Um, <laughs> we've still got more things to do, but that first puzzle is very easy, especially for like mid to high skill players. That puzzle is something they can just cakewalk through. They understand, they move through. So you've got to make sure that second puzzle introduces a twist that's going to challenge some people. So how do you add this difficulty back in? I, I don't think you think about it as difficulty. I think you think about it as surprise and intentionality. You try and think about something that's going to make the player go, oh, I didn't expect that to happen, and also make the player go, ah, I think I know what I need to do to get past this. So we cast the net really wide, and we did lots of, like, lots of different iterations on different ways we could use this mechanic. Um, and a lot of them weren't very good, but we did find some nice little things in there that we really wanted to use. These two particular screens, we were like, oh, there's something in here. Like, we, we need to use these, but these particular puzzles aren't the right way to do it. So the first thing is about noticing being on the wrong side. That idea of 
intentionality coming from like, oh, uh, the button's just over there. I'm just going to ride this to the end. Oh, no, I'm upside down. So what we require of the player here is they know, oh, I have to get off the block. The block isn't actually going to get me there. I've got to do something else in the level. Um, and the second thing is that this block orientation is still getting in your way. And by the end of it, you have to use these multiple rotators in order to reorientate it. So we're making sure that the player understands in a simple way on its own that they, they have to reconfigure these blocks in order to make the bridge to the end and get to the end of the level. Um, and then the third thing, which is the kind of surprising thing, which we don't actually do in the third puzzle, is that you combine two of these blocks in order to get from the lower portion of the level to the upper portion level, a gap that you couldn't cross before, but now you can due to this combination. And it's a nice little surprise that isn't repeated later on the level and keeps the novelty there. Oh. Oh. So that's, yeah, so there, you've kind of grabbed all your bits and you've tutorialized them all, everything apart from the handles retracting when you're walking on that block. And I think that's important. You still need a surprise there. Otherwise, if you get to a puzzle and you've tutorialized everything, it's just an exercise. You know what you're doing. There's no surprises. So you need to both, in this puzzle, understand these handles retracting works like the rest of the game, but also you have to do these two things at the same time, getting on and off and changing orientation rather than using them in isolation. So that's the level. That's the three, uh, the three puzzles that make it up. And it, by the end of it, hopefully, makes a brand new mechanic feel familiar to a player of any skill level. And we repeat this over the game, where each level kind of introduces a new mechanic or a new concept, and it gets tutorialized and then played through. And at the very end, you end up with a puzzle where the training wheels are off, and we require the player to actually stop, think, and consider what's going on. This was our kind of reward as to why we knew Oh, video cannot be loaded. OK, it isn't. So the, the, the nicest reward we got was a, couple, a week or so ago, we got this wonderful video of this little kid crying on a bed, uh, crying to her mum and showing her mum one of the last puzzles in the game. And she's crying, saying, I'm so happy. Like, they're together. They're best friends forever. And uh, it like, broke our hearts and made us feel like, wow, it's really important to us. There's this little, this little kid who's clearly like primary school age has managed to get through that whole game and experience that whole story and get to the end. So yeah, oh, there's my, there's my subtitles, because you can't understand it because she's, she's so upset. <laughs> um, so those are my like, key takeaways for like, how we approached what we were doing, kind of playing with and explore the fundamentals of a mechanic, make sure you're always bringing something new, um, breaking apart the idea and trying to work out what every composite part is so you can teach it. Uh, that novelty helps higher skill players stay engaged, bringing new things into the fold every level, kind of like even though they're short and even though they're easy, you're kind of experiencing and learning the whole time. Um, and then these last two things, allowing for intentionality early, so testing early, not just saying, oh, these are just the tutorials we don't need to test, but testing every time you teach something new to make sure they understand, but also to keep them engaged. And then at the end, always taking the training wheels off and leaving the player to solve a problem on their own in the world. So that's it.